Space communications. These will be among the main topics for dialogue. The, the concept to me is absolutely ludicrous, that there's all this wealth and all this resources and all this food, and then there are all these people who can't get it. Will, good to see you, man. Nice to see you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming down. Appreciate it. So happy to be here in your amazing house. Cool. So where we met five, six years ago, I think it was. Yeah, I would say almost. Yeah, yeah. we're looking coming up on six. I think came up with Ron and we we caught up up in Ubud. Yeah. And um, first impressions when when we met was not only are you an amazing chef, that's a given, but you were really passionate, or you are passionate about doing it for the kids, and you've created this amazing sort of unit up there in Ubud of this sort of the, these kids that are coming from all the different parts of Indonesia that maybe haven't experienced even eating in a restaurant, never mind being part of any culinary scene, and you're giving them framework, education. It's pretty inspiring to see. Where, where does that come from? I, we're really lucky with our, with our amazing team and the kids that work there. That I mean, a lot of them now that you met five or six years ago are now running the restaurant. Our chef, you know, who's been eight years and started with me out of culinary school, or uh, our general manager who started as a bar back, because he was too young to get a job anywhere else. You know, our former steward who's running the savory kitchen. It just, we have, most of our senior team has been more than five years with us. Uh, and I don't know, I, people have asked me that a lot over the past five years, and I never really have a good answer. I just know it's better to give people a chance. And I, I've always felt strongly that access is really important. And, and it's not so much about talent, although talent plays a part. It's not so much about hard work, although that plays a part. Uh, but a lot of people are talented and work hard, but not everybody has access. And I think that's really critical. And when you come somewhere like Bali or like Indonesia, which has such a diversity of access and such a history of access either being allowed or denied based on other criteria, it just seemed to be the natural thing to do to give people a chance. And it's really been great for us. We've had such an amazing ride. You know, we, we started with training our team. We've sent them all over the world. I mean, we sent, we sent seven of our staff abroad uh, last year to restaurants all over the world. We're bringing six of the best chefs, or we were bringing six of the best chefs in the world this year. To, so for all, because our team is now so big, it's almost 40. And we, we wanted to introduce the, our staff who couldn't travel to some of the best chefs in the world. But it's constant. I'm, it's sort of a dialogue, I think. We, we're hoping to share experience with people who are really passionate. And the result is really great uh, for, for me. For, but for me, for our staff, I think we've been, I, I feel like it's, we're really lucky. And I think that, I think that both, of, both of us feel really lucky. Yeah, yeah it's amazing to see, because when I come up to the restaurant, does feel more like an academy or like a family that are kind of there to really help each other and grow and develop. And literally, I meet a girl who's there washing dishes or just starting out, and six months later, she's running the whole kitchen and, you know, creating these desserts at a certain level within such a short space of time. It's pretty incredible. I mean, I don't know what, what your secret is or how you're doing it, but it's a, it's a good vibe, man, and it's, it's inspiring. I'm, I'm super, uh, I mean, Chatri, so, like, again, we, we have such an amazing diversity of kids. And I, again, the, the big thing for me is access. Like, you'd be amazed what's there if you give someone a chance. And for me, everybody talks about local ingredients. And for some reason, no one ever talks about people. Uh, like, for us, that's our first ingredient is people. So if, we, if we're working with being local and then we're importing all of our expertise, like that doesn't make any sense. I mean, we don't import all of our products, so we all, why would we import our expertise? And I think that's an important thing that 
a business in Bali is run by young Balinese people. To me, it just seems natural. I don't think there's any, I don't think that should be the exception. That should be the rule. Uh, I also think that Bali, you know, without being too cynical, not everyone has always come to Indonesia with the best intentions of how to develop, uh, how to help people to be self-sufficient rather than generate wealth for others. And it would be nice uh, for, for businesses for that to be trendy uh, because it's, it's really, it's not a good vibe to be like asset stripping of people. It's just a, so, so for us, it's, it's like there isn't really, we never considered doing it another way. I mean, even, even before we opened Room for Dessert and I worked at Coup d'etat, you know, the 15 year old daughter of the woman who was doing our lights uh, started doing our, started working in pastry with me. She just helped to open the Des Potato Head actually in the pastry department. And, I, you know, so someone that I saw 10 years ago who started with me at 15 is now helping to set up the pastry program there. Uh, you know, Chatri runs our kitchen. She started with us at 16. Uh, Grace, Colming, any, any star, who's our service director, started with us at 19. Uh, and we, you know, we're, we're the first job for most of our staff. And our restaurant is the first restaurant most of our staff have eaten in. But the quality that I think they produce is to a pretty good standard. And I think that just shows if you focus on those people that you can get a great result. Yeah, and they also they, they all have such a great vibe and, and demeanor about them, and it's that the, the sort of proud to be there, and they're working hard, and it, it's a yeah, it's it's a it's an education, not just culinary. It's, it's it goes beyond that. And well, you're coming to their house. I mean, if you go to Room for Dessert, you're coming to our staff's house. Like it's that simple. It's whether it's brother, sister, aunt, whoever. Like so so yes, it's an academy in some ways, but it's really just a big house. And there's people from all over Bali, there's people from all over Indonesia, there's a sprinkling of people from around the world, which I think also adds a level of richness to it. But the most important thing is like, that's a, you're there, it's a house, maybe the house gets bigger, but it keeps the same spirit. Yeah, it's community, it's family, all the things that we need today. Well, and you can't fake that. You can't say you're local and community minded and then bring in people from other places to tell you what to do. It just doesn't, they don't go together. Yeah. It doesn't work. Yeah, totally, man. We're living in crazy times, global pandemic, first of its kind in 100 years. The States right now, there's some major things happening over there. It's pretty obvious that we need some fundamental change, like big changes need to happen. Um, and working in the food industry or the hospitality industry, there's a pretty big pandemic going on, which I think has maybe been forgotten about, or it's certainly not in the newspapers any days, one that of starvation, of hunger. There's literally a billion people hungry and starving today. I think is a, I read a statistic, every 10 seconds a child dies from starvation, every 10 seconds. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. Um, and then on the other hand, we have an abundance of food waste. I mean, I used to work in a supermarket when I was 15 in England, and I was working on the, the dairy, you know, stacking milk and yogurt and cheese, doing all the dairy stuff. So it would be items that had a very short um, shelf life. And I was the kid at the end of the night that had to just throw it all in the skip and, and the grinder and grind it all up. And it was pallets of stuff. I mean, it was unbelievable. And I used to kind of, you know, being young, I used to sort of eat the cheese and try and just sort of, you know, eat it before it went out. But it was, yeah, it just felt like even when I was 15 year old, it felt wrong. And it's still happening today, man. How can we have so many people starving, so much food waste, which is getting thrown away, which is then impacting the soil and killing the planet? Like there's a total imbalance going on there. How the hell do we even look at that? Is it distribution? Or what? What? Yeah, do you I mean, that's much thought into you that? know the global pandemic, uh, police brutality, lack of justice, financial inequality, current virus, and lack of insurance. I mean, the the right now is a a time. I guess the best thing I can say is it's a time where you would hope that structural change can come because you have no choice. And I think the issue of food waste and hunger has traditionally not been particularly sexy from a marketing point of view and i don't know why that is maybe it's because it needs gala dinners to support it financially uh, but there's a certain there's such a disconnect here where you incentivize people to create waste like it's a it's a systemic flaw you can't pay people to create garbage uh, and let alone pay people to dispose of waste when it's food and people are starving it's just such a the need and the demand and the product are not met so structurally 
I mean, again, this is way above my pay grade, but I would say you need to subsidize the repurposing of food waste rather than subsidize the destruction of it. It's very simple. Like you can't pay people or, or, or motivate them financially through other means to, to create more garbage. It's just, it's just insanity. Uh, the planet's choking on waste. People are literally starving. Uh, millions of people are in food banks in the wealthiest countries in the world. It's an absolute catastrophe. We're not talking, I, I mean, I talked with someone from World Central Kitchen, which is Jose Andres' uh, team, and about two years ago at MAD, and they were saying, we're talking like they were in Lombok, went after the, the volcano and, and, uh, and after the tsunami and all this destruction, and they were also in LA, in Orange County. You know, these are like people that are trying to get food to firefighters in the wealthiest counties in the world. And then the same people applying disaster relief in like deserted Caribbean islands, you know, like in Puerto Rico. It, it, the, the concept to me is absolutely ludicrous that there's all this wealth and all this resources and all this food. And then there are all these people who can't get it. That, that to me is, is shocking. That's crazy. Yeah, it's shocking. So you have operations that are literally throwing stuff away in their backyard when the guy at the other end of the wall can't eat. Or their own, <laughs> or their own staff. Or their own or, staff, or, yeah. Or their own staff. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the even more shocking is like, it's not even someone, like we can't even anymore say it's someone in the third world or it's someone in the developing world or it's someone in another county or it's not in my backyard. It's like, it's your staff. You know, like, mm -hmm. so, so for us, that was the biggest thing where on a micro level, look, I mean, the solution for hunger is simple. Give people food. You know, like there's no, you don't need to have a big plan to know that the right thing to do if someone's hungry or you think they're going to be hungry is to get them food. So the biggest thing when we started, when this current crisis came and we closed room for dessert, the first decision we made was, okay, so we're going to close the restaurant so we can focus on feeding our staff. All right, we got that sorted in the first week. And then we said, okay, before we even enter any operation to try to claw towards, I mean, we're not even in, in a discussion of breaking even, just about you know, cutting losses basically. The next thing we did was say, okay, people are going to be hungry. Everyone's losing their job. And so what can we do? And so we started our Dharma Buns initiative, which was to get food to people who need it. We've had a lot of support from Indosol. We've had a lot of support um, from all over. And the response has been great. We're sending thousands of meals a month. And again, like from a very micro level, what can you do? Give people food. You know, like yeah. we talked a lot about the plan for the bus and meal distribution. And I think it's really a great initiative. And a, like, I think sometimes we get held up trying to pro create the perfect solution to a problem when there's like a perfectly good solution right there. You just know, gotta do it. Just give people food. Don't legislate. Don't committee it. Just it's, it's like, we don't even have a discussion. We have food available. If you come up, you get food. That's it. We, we didn't even have to text us before. You didn't even have to tell us where you're from. You didn't even have to tell us your name. Food's available for you. Um, we found that there is a stigma around being hungry, even here, which I find very sad. Um, so, so part of what we said is like, you know, it's not, there's nothing to be ashamed of to be hungry. Uh, I think that's also a mentality that we need to break through. And I'm hoping as tens of millions of people are unemployed in the wealthiest countries in the world, in the US and the UK, food banks are stripped of all their food. Like, this can't be something where it's your fault that you're hungry and it's on you to fix it. Like people are hungry. So, so we need to be a little more creative in how we mobilize our resources because just everything is such a disaster if you can't eat. I mean, although there was a great quote that I saw this morning from a friend of mine who has something called art of plating. And they said, um, if, you know, how can we eat if we can't breathe? So there, there are currently some issues being brought to the forefront. Uh, which are pretty critical for survival. I don't think food is far down that list. Uh, not killing someone for walking down the street, that would be a good start. Um, but making sure people have some food is, is pretty close behind that. Uh, so from our side, we just try to focus on like what good can we do today? And then how can we do better tomorrow? And how do we position ourselves so that, I mean, we're not a charity, we're, we're a business. We're, we're not like cynical about it or, or holier than that. We have a small business. So, so our impact is small, but we can be disproportionately impactful by highlighting certain behavior or modeling certain behavior and just trying to do the right thing or, or trying to do the best that we can. I think that's okay for today. And then we can try to do better tomorrow. Uh, it's the same attitude we have in our kitchen. It's the same attitude we have with the food. Uh, it's why we're still pushing every day like we just opened. Uh, but I think 
aggressively pursuing ways to help more and more people is really a nice way to think about your business model rather than solely in pursuit of other things. Mm. Yeah, it's sad to hear that the stigma that's attached with people who can't eat or people that are starving, they're almost embarrassed to come and take, you, you mentioned earlier, embarrassed to come and take the free meals because they don't want to look bad in front of other people. Or in front, in front of their family. Or, or their, their families, but they're, they're starving. I mean, that's such a sad situation, man. And look, for us, we have 40 staff. I mean, so for us, we could have, I mean, the best thing for us to do right now is to, would have been to close the restaurant three months ago, send everybody home and keep money in the bank. I mean, it's as simple as that. It's a decision that all of the biggest businesses, many of the bus biggest businesses have made here. Uh, but it's just terrible. Like, so, so, so our solution in a, so the solution that's being peddled in a public health crisis is fire all your staff. In, in other countries, that means no food, you know, no health insurance. Like, so from our side, it was very simple. Like, why would we send 40 young kids, make them poor and hungry as a solution to public health? Like, that's where there's a big disconnect between food and health. Like, we're taking away the resources that people have to stay healthy by not giving them food. So, so for me, that's just like the, that's the d definition of insanity to, to just rob people of food and resources in a pandemic. Um, so we went, we tried to go the other way. Um, but it would be nice. We aren't in a position that we can really afford to do that. But regrettably, the companies who are in a position to afford to do that are not, are, are, are the, are the ones making the quote unquote better financial decisions. And I don't agree that that's a better financial decision unless you think in the very, very short term. I think it's terrible to, to create a scenario where people don't trust you uh, because you're stripping them of their benefits when things are bad and not giving them when they're good. But, but again, for us, it's very, very simple. It's like, if you're hungry, we want to help you. And, that's, and, then, and then our solution, if we help you, is then maybe we can help somebody else. So, Will, in modern times, things have become a lot more convenient on the level of, you know, we're consuming more. You know, if we, if we want to grab some food, we can pop to the supermarket or the store. And in the current pandemic, one thing that struck me was, oh, the supermarkets or the stores might be closed. Shit, how do we, like, even if you have money, you can't eat because the supermarket might be closed. Ah, everybody running to the supermarket, getting as much as they could, this hoarding type of panic set in. And it made me think, we've forgotten how to survive as human beings. Like we don't grow, or the majority of people don't grow anything. We don't even know where to start. We've lost that basic fundamental sort of way of being as a human, of looking after ourselves. I know you've got the garden, you're a big, big advocate of permaculture. Where do we, do, do we need to sort of relook at, so how do we go back to being self-sufficient or what's it's your hard. thoughts on that? Yeah. It's hard. And again, it's really, it's above my pay grade, like most sort of meta uh, issues. But again, from a micro level where we're very comfortable operating, I mean, we're not even a big hospitality organization. You know, we're a 20 seat dessert place uh, with one single menu, uh, but we can model effective behavior. So the, when we had a chance to expand, it was, you know, do we build another restaurant? Do we build rooms or do we just plant? And so the decision for us to grow uh, two years ago was we basically surrounded the restaurant with a thousand or 1200 square meters of garden, which by is definitely not farming and it's not agriculture, but it is a place where our team learns about the importance of the growth cycle of plants. Uh, we focus specifically on Balinese medicinal plants, which are really great since a lot of our staff have grown up buying powder at the Jamu store on the side of the road. I think one of the most important things to understand is the supply chain. So, so if you have a team or you have a young person and they're, you know, most of the young kids, even as you mentioned, like they don't go to the, they go to the supermarket because it's more prestigious than the traditional Pasar. But even at the Pasar, the products are brought from all over. So, so one of the things that we started was, okay, let's, let's get away from the suppliers and let's, let's start focusing on the supply chain. So how do we get to the local markets? How do we get to the farms and how do we grow our own to generate a better seed that we can then bring back to our farmers and having all of our staff work in the garden every day has really helped us to understand what it means to get great product. But again, there's so many people doing more ambitious farm projects for us. This was a real small dip in the pool. 
but it's true that we have let go of a lot of traditional wisdom, not just with regards to agriculture. And people are seeing now, and Bali is a great example, right? I think, you know, you have this dialogue in Bali, especially with the Balinese, like about the importance of tradition. And then, you know, you have a lot of so-called experts, myself included, saying, no, 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 this is the way you have to do it. I would say that, you know, there's no, there's not this faux like pastoral ideal and everyone in Williamsburg is going to suddenly go back to the farm or, or in shortage or I don't even, it's probably not even shortage, which is cool anymore in the UK or Hackney or where, you know, like not everyone's going to become a farmer on Friday and start growing their own vegetables, even if they have compost at home. But some basic survival skills would be nice and maybe a little bit of perceived wisdom about the natural world, how plants are involved. And I think one of the things that, it would, I mean, Again, and you have this issue in Bali, even with when it pertains to rice farming. I mean, rice farming is hard. Rice farmers don't want to keep rice farming because it's really difficult. Uh, and the land has become so valuable. It's kind of, again, you're creating this fake economy where it's not to your advantage to keep pursuing your traditional crafts. And that's a shame. And I would hope from this pandemic, I know Indonesia has spoken a lot about the new normal and this desire of sort of quality over quantity and specifically the desire to focus on agriculture and natural beauty being outdoors and having this engagement with your surroundings uh, which is seems to have been disconnected from the current tourism model where and i think that has to change or you will just see this problem repeated but bigger in 10 years mm. yeah, it's interesting because here in bali i guess everybody was just naturally self-sufficient 60 70 yeah, 80 not, year ago and, and, and they've now maybe more wealthy, and it's not just specifically to Bali, it's all over the world, right? I mean, we, we, we started off you know, with agriculture on a smaller scale, looking after ourselves and families, globalization, as we continue to grow and grow and grow, less land, you know, we consume rather than grow. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty uh, complex situation. And it's hard to draw a line and say, you know, everything was great until this year, and then, then it became shit, or, I mean, I do think that there are certain trends in the last century that have not necessarily been helpful, but there's been amazing advances in different ways. You know, people are living longer, diseases are being cured, you know, people are being fed at, at mass levels, but it, the, the paces in technology have struggled to keep up with the population growth, frankly. Uh, but the, and the ability of a small, poor community to defend itself from w a wealthy uh, community whether you want to call it uh, imperialism or tourism, you know, whatever it is, it's just very hard to, it's very hard to defend a rice field against a hotel developer. Yeah. At the end of the day, you're probably going to lose. Uh, one of the things the Balinese have done really well is protect key areas. And I, actually, Ubud, one of the reasons we love Ubud so much is, you know, you, and you're seeing a lot of development in Ubud, and Ubud is renowned as a center of tourism for a century. I mean, the first hotels in Bali were in Ubud a century ago. Uh, but this idea that not everything's for sale, I think is really important. And this idea that retaining a sense of culture and identity is critical. Uh, I think that's a small step. And I would say if tr tourism in Bali and Indonesia can stick with that kind of messaging, that would be a great solution. And frankly, it could be a great model for tourism around the world. I think this is something that you're seeing people struggle with, whether it's Tulum or, or uh, pick anywhere on the coast of Thailand. There's so many places in the world that have been destroyed by tourism. And there aren't a lot of places that can model being saved by tourism. <laughs> so to me, that would be a really nice transition to this kind of quality. And people pay lip service to ethical tourism, and it's very sort of trendy. Yeah. But again, I think you're still talking about a minority and you're still not necessarily and this is when it gets really tough you may be talking about harmony of the environment but you're not necessarily talking about empowering the next generation mm. i mean i think that's something we focus on a lot and we've talked about before for our young staff like coming and grace you know we help them to open an apron company so so we were their first customers and we've been really supportive of them and trying to show not just how to cook but how to run your own business uh, in terms of making people who live here be, help them to be self-sufficient. It's again, coming from a family of textile workers, but being able to apply that to sort of a contemporary demand. Uh, and that to me is, 
that transition right there, that moment where you can sort of take traditional wisdom and help model how that can be marketed to a current generation, that would be a really nice um, development. And I think you, I think at, at Potato Head, you've seen a lot of that kind of behavior modeling. And I think that's one of the reasons why people are so attracted to the design and all the projects is because you're able to integrate this, you're able to integrate this idea that there's a connection between tradition and modernity. And I think that's really important. Yeah, it's interesting. One thing at Potato Head, we, which we created a couple of years ago now is when we started our zero waste mission was the lab. And the idea behind the lab was we'd send a lot of our waste there and then see what we could actually do with that waste and kind of change the perception of waste and, and make it um, into a valuable thing. So creating food waste into material, which then gets turned into a chair. Now, if you could then make that into a sustainable business model for your staff to run, you then get into the realms of circular economy. And, and I think you're already doing it now with you know, the, the aprons and, and, and you've got this sort of little family of entrepreneurs. So I think that's something we touched on waste earlier that businesses are going to start looking into. Of how could I make this circular? So you're not so relying on outside sort of sources and whether that's farming or waste or... I mean, even, even Henry Ford, who wasn't necessarily the nicest guy for a variety of reasons, um, the whole idea that, you know, you can't have a car factory if your staff can't afford to buy your cars. Uh, I think that that idea where, where you can't have this massive redistribution of wealth and, and separating poor people from wealth and expect that, like, at the very fundamental level of sustainability is like, are your staff hungry? Are your staff poor? Are your staff motivated to, to be able to take care of themselves in a contemporary context? And you know, not everyone needs to be an entrepreneur. There, there, there's, there's not, there, there's no demand or desire for everyone to behave in a certain way. Uh, but it is relevant for people to feel that they're in control of their own destiny. And in that, and and from my side, that's been very useful for me. I don't think it's the only thing that's useful for me, but it's really helped to share that perspective. So, and it's one of the reasons why, again, our team, you know you're coming to their house when you come here. It's their place. That sense of ownership uh, from me is really, really critical to pretty much everything that we do. Yeah, amazing. I mean, to give that, that opportunity of ownership of a future where you could become self-sustainable, it's a pretty amazing thing to do. Even though you mentioned a micro level, it's very inspiring for, for as a globally recognized restaurant to be doing that, even at a small scale. It's, it's definitely going to have a a, a, you know, spider web effect of, you know, ripple effect of, uh, of spreading and more people becoming inspired by it and hopefully implementing their own businesses. So it's good, so good trend to be going world. viral. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and another thing you mentioned earlier was um, medicinal plants. Um, now, food, you know, from nature is medicine. It's something which I think maybe we've forgotten a little bit about as well on a mainstream level. How important is that to you on a level of nourishment? And obviously you have the garden, so we know that that's going to be specifically beneficial on a level of medicinal. But today I'm hearing a lot about people waiting for a vaccine and, you know, we can't get, we're not going to get better until we get a vaccine. But why aren't we talking about how do I boost my immunity and my, my you know, make myself better through food and through herbs? Have you, have you put much thought into that? Or how do you sort of implement that in your own business? Well. I mean, the best way to improve your immune system is to have a balanced diet. So, so not being hungry is a great way. Making sure someone's not hungry is a great way to help make sure they're strong enough to combat infection. It's one of the reasons why our staff meal, which we also offer, you know, is we use all organic products and we, we carefully cook everything. It's really critical to us that our staff eat well and that the people and the meals that we give away are healthy and sustainable. And, and again, let's go to the definition of sustainable is like you're not dying of hunger is a pretty fundamental uh, step towards sustainability. Uh, and I think that, so we, we focus very much on that with our food and eating correctly, having a proper diet, working with our team to have a better diet. And more specifically, we talk about m more medicinal traditions where, but and uh, there are some great people, you know, Chokde who runs uh, Tirto Sada in Ubud is really inspirational. There are some great people in Ubud who focus on food as medicine. Uh, Robin Lim, who runs uh, Bumi Sehat as well. And we apply a lot of the things that we've learned from them to, to try to, 
I don't know. We, we're, again, we're a restaurant. We sell desserts and cocktails. We're, we're not a health food place. But people feel good when they leave after eating 30 things. And I think a lot of that has to do with the digestive and healing and anti-inflammatory properties of the plants that we're using. But I would say that's really a work in progress. And I'm very careful to not be, we're not claiming to be doctors or nurses, but we are respectful of the medicinal tradition. And we think that it would be really nice if people started to pay more attention to that rather than buying pills, which, I mean, again, frequently in many cases are using the products that were originally grown. You know, like aspirin is a great example. I mean, these are like, these are products that were originally plant-based. They're just now chemically synthesized. So, so I think the term chemical is slightly misleading in that context, but in our case, you know, there are some really great, I'm a big Jammu believer. There's hundreds of and thousands of different uh, remedies and traditional remedies, which we've worked with. And they've definitely helped all of us feel healthier. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of Jammu. I drink it every yeah. day, twice a day, man. You know, not like there's a reason why people are still around. You know, it's not because always of technology. I mean, the original, you know, knowledge is important still. And I think that would be a great message for us to share that traditional wisdom is still relevant. Just going back to the waste issue slightly, have you looked much into using food waste as an alternative to sort of food packaging or food as material? Have you guys looked into that much? And I guess in, here in Bali, it's just done by default. Things are served on a, on a bamboo leaf or, or, or trays are made from, you know, leaves from trees or, or different things. And we, again, I don't have your design background, but I mean, all of our plateware for our new dishes were compostable and leaves and but, but that's again, that's not us creating anything. That's just doing what was naturally done uh, uh, as recently as 10 or 20 years ago in some communities in Bali still being done now. From a design perspective, less, although we should be doing it more. We repurpose, I mean, we also like to reduce our consumption by repurposing everything that we have. Uh, whether that's, I mean, we're still using the materials that were there when we got there. Uh, we just opened a new shop on Batumejan and all of the materials were repurposed from our uh, restaurant from five years ago. Uh, we believe in maintaining our equipment, not throwing it away. We believe in uh, reducing our consumption of disposable materials. We're incredibly strict on our waste management and we are incredibly aggressive in pursuing the use of waste or byproducts as another product. I think there's a, you know, there's a chef in Copenhagen, Matt Orlando, who does a really great job at a mass of, you know, no such thing as a byproduct, just another product is kind of his mantra. And I think from a culinary side, I mean, we're deep into like the seventh usage of old coffee grounds and different types of things. Um, and packaging again, whether it's reused old bottles or, or, or We've been doing that for so long that sometimes we forget to talk about it. And I think that's also something critical is, I think we take for granted that this is just what everyone should be doing anyway. Like not, it shouldn't be, and this is something I think Fergus Henderson spoke about years ago about farmer's market. It's like, well, you know, why are you talking about it today that your food is fresh and local? Like where the fuck was it from yesterday? And I mean, like to me, I mean, everyone should be doing that all the time. There's not really any other option. I mean, you're not local and sustainable if you're creating waste. Like that's at a fundamental level. You're just not, it's not sustainable to create weight, more waste. Um, that's not a, that outcome doesn't work. Um, so I don't think we're at zero waste and nor do we purport to be. Uh, and it, we, it's not branding for us. We just do it because it's right. It's, it's just better. And it, I think that's the most important thing from our side. From a design side, I think there's a lot we could learn. I love the tabletops, the repurposed materials. Um, I'm wearing, you know, like our flip-flops and our, our, are made from old tires. And I think there's a lot of ways to commodify waste, which is, which is really, really wonderful. But I also think that it would be really nice to reduce consumption and generate less waste um, is a nice model as well. Um, and that comes from really cleverly designing your menus. So, you know, for example, from us from the garden, we use a leaf for this and a flower for this and a fruit for this. Um, and again, creating an environment where all of our research and development is plant-based, all of our products are grown, all of the byproducts can be composted. Like that already is a really, really great circle. Um, our, our plants don't come in packaging. 
you know, they, they come in the original packaging. So that's a big, uh, that's a big shift to be focused on those things. We're always trying to improve, though, whenever we see anything that we can possibly learn from. Uh, if there's one thing that we've done for years, it's just if there's a way for us to do something better or someone that we know or can find is doing something better, then we want to do that. We don't want to wait. We want to do it right now. We want to make it better right now. And uh, whether that's hunger or sustainability issues or, or personal development, like we don't want to wait for a better business model to tell us what we should do. We just want to fix it right now. And we want to make it better today and wake up tomorrow and try to make it better tomorrow. Awesome. And the culinary experience at Room for Dessert, <laughs> moving on. Well, um, so, so yeah, I mean, for me, it was, I mean, first time I went, it was just mind blowing. I'd never tasted dessert like that. Um, couldn't even describe what it was other than just crazy explosions of flavors and textures and just an experience, man. I mean, who goes and eats nine I think these days it's 20, 25 desserts in one sitting, but wow. And, and it sounds kind of pretty crazy. And how the, how the hell do you put nine desserts in your body? But when you go, you realize, wow, this is not um, what I expected in a really fucking cool way. And quite often now, because I have a lot of friends in town, I'll always bring them up to room for dessert, whether that's traveling DJs or musicians or artists or whatever. And they, they always say the same thing, like, we're going to go and eat like nine desserts. I don't really like desserts. I'm like, just, just trust me, just come. And it's not like you're just stuffing your face with sugar. It's not heavy. It's, it's yeah, like, how have you managed to do that? Like, is, is, is it the plants from the garden? Is it the, because it's the something that I haven't tasted anywhere else. I mean, what's the secret behind that? Or how are you doing it? I don't know that we've figured out the secret yet, but it's nice of you. I'm happy that you, and then it's been great having your support. And I know having all these great people coming through there is really great for us and for our staff. Um, I think we've really tried to, we've really just tried to keep working on making a great experience every day. And from the beginning of the day to the end, that's all we're focused on whether that's reducing sugar to, so you can eat more things, introducing savory elements, working with plants to help with digestion, pairing with alcohols which can aid digestion or, or no alcohol, and also really focusing on crafting a menu that's well-balanced and goes together and isn't too confusing or jumping all over the place. And fun also, like a little bit of a sense of humor goes a long way, I think, in a meal. It's so boring to sit in a dining room and be like lectured to for three hours. So. Moving around, I think, has helped a lot. Walking through the gardens, being part of the plants. But, um, and I think we've come a long way. This is an interesting pause for us. Um, who knows? You know, maybe we never exist as a restaurant anymore. We become a soup kitchen, which is basically what we are now. Um, but, but I'd like to think that there's still a desire to try to make amazing things. And so for us, that's really what we try to do every day, try to make something amazing. Cool. So the Netflix Chef's Table, which you did a full, um, there was a full documentary on you and the restaurant. Well, how much impact has that had on, did it change much or how, how has it been since the Netflix thing went out? It's been a really, it was a really great experience for us. I think it introduced us to a whole new audience. We'd been lucky, to, to be fair, I think we were lucky it came out in our fifth year. Uh, I don't know that we would have been able to handle it earlier. And I also think that we had sort of a nice and steady uh, but not as broad following. Um, and it really changed our year round business and our, and our demand, uh, which has been really amazing. It's given us a chance to do so much. And uh, it's given us a chance to grow the garden, train more staff, you know, feed more people, do, do all the things that are really important in a restaurant. Um, I think things like that are, I don't, you know, they're not important in and of themselves. They, they, we've always worked really, really hard to do the work that's worth talking about rather than pursue like a traditional marketing or, or, or anything. But I mean, it was great. It's such a great program. The producers are amazing. Uh, the staff are amazing. The, Brian and his team, Adam Bricker, all these guys are just so, so great. Um, and I think it was a really great experience. I, I, I felt really satisfied. It, it happened to come out at the time when we released our first book as well. And, and I tend to be pretty traditional, so I also really value having the, the paper. We did an amazing book with Fidon, a uh, great design-centered publisher in, well, in, in uh, your hometown. That, you know, 2018 was a really, really great year. Um, 2017 had been a lot of struggle after the volcanoes. 
And I think now we're back in the middle of another dogfight, you know, to see if we make it uh, to tomorrow. Uh, but we're saying it's definitely given us the strength and resolve that we're doing something right. And, and it's given us a chance to communicate to more people things that we believe in, which is really great. And on a final note, Will, any advice on any young kids coming through, a man of your experience, your knowledge? <laughs> Have you, got, have you got any, what words of wisdom can you give for the next generation coming through? Big question, but give us well, what you got. I think that the currently there's a lack of interest in the doing of things versus the watching. And I think an interest of doing things would be really, would serve a lot of young aspiring culinary people really, really well. Um, learning how to do the basics learning how to do the fundamentals, paying attention, taking time, being patient, and really finding a good mentor. I don't know that I could give better advice than that. Uh, I, but I do think there's an opportunity now for people who care, smart people who care about social justice issues or, or a lot of the issues we've been talking about today uh, to apply themselves in this industry. And it is a great industry. I'm, I'm been in hospitality industry for 30 years and I love it and I wouldn't be doing anything else. Um, but yeah, focus, uh, work hard, come in, take your time. There's no rush to, I mean, we've had two years of success out of 20. I mean, and we're like at the top of our game. So, you know, enjoy, enjoy failure. It's very character building. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Will, thank you so much, man. Well, um, keep up the great work. It's, you're inspiring all of us and the industry or the world needs more people like you, man. So thank you so much. Great to catch up. Thanks, Sam. And we'll, we'll talk soon. Thanks.